you've got a Bible, we are going to start a brand new series this morning uh, through the book of Jonah. Jonah, it's in the Old Testament. It's a tiny little book. It's four chapters. We're going to go through it over the next four weeks. And so, uh, Jonah, if you've grown up in church, especially if you grew up in like kids' Sunday school classes, you're familiar with the story of Jonah and the whale. And so, but there's a lot more in this book than just Jonah and the whale. And so this book, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to set it up, and I'm going to show you some words that actually Jesus said about Jonah, and then I'm going to pray for us. And so this book, the best way to describe it, it's a really small book with a really big message. A really small book with a really big message, and Jonah and the whale are not the main characters of the book. Nineveh is not even the main character of the book. The main character of the book of Jonah is God. And you're going to see that because God has both the first and the last word uh, in the book of Jonah. And you see a lot of big uh, spiritual themes throughout this book. You see that God cares for all human beings. You see that God punishes sin. You see God's sovereignty or God does what he wants to do. You see God's compassion on display. And then you're going to see 800 years after this happened, Jesus would point to it as a sign that would point ultimately to Jesus. And so it's a really tiny, small book with some really big spiritual implications that you and I are just going to walk through over the next four weeks. And so I want to start, I want to read some words of of Jesus and what he said about Jonah, and then we're going to pray. And so I'm going to start uh, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, and here's what it says. It says, one day some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, teacher, We want you to show us a miraculous sign to prove your authority. But Jesus replied, only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. And so Jesus is talking about Jonah. That happened 800 years before Jesus. But it would be a sign that would talk about Jesus than being buried three days and three nights. And he said someone ultimately is greater than Jonah. And Jesus would reference himself. But talking about Jonah. And if you grew up in Sunday school, you know this as Jonah and the whale. But if you read there in the text, it says Jonah and the really big fish. Let me just kind of tell you how that happens. And so um, in the original language, it, it can mean one of three things. It can mean really big fish, which if you have a NIV translation or an ESV or an NLT, you'll see it in there. In the King James, it's translated as whale. Um, and then in the New American Standard, my favorite, it's translated as sea monster. <laughs> right. But Jonah and the sea monster doesn't make a good kid Sunday school curriculum. Like, Jonah and the sea monster, ah, you freak out. So anyway, so Jonah and the whale works. All right, so, but but this is what this whole book is about. And God uses Jonah and this whale and Nineveh and their repentance to really, really talk and give a a message to the nation of Israel. And and then ultimately for us to look and to dive into these spiritual principles and overlay them into our life. Let me pray for us. Jesus I pray that in this moment, over these next few weeks, God, that you would take this little book of Jonah, God, and you would work it deep into our hearts. God, and my prayer is that we would become more and more like Christ in the way we think, in the way we act, in the way we, we, we move about our lives. And Lord, my prayer is that the Spirit of God would be present and felt here in our hearts and minds and souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in our family, we have this mobile app that we've downloaded a couple of years ago, and it's on my phone, it's on Brianna's phone, and it's on our oldest son, Daniel's phone. He's 14. And the app is called Life360, Life360. And if you have a student, my guess is you're familiar with this app. If not, it's very, very simple. You put it on your phone, and it just tells you where that person is at all times. It tells you how fast they drive, how many stops they made. It's a, yeah, it's a fascinating uh, um, kind of a low jack for a human being. Pretty cool. So, um, so it, it's a fascinating app, and on this app, it has like home and work and school, and you can label all these different things. And so it says, you know, like, dad is at work, or Daniel is at school, that, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, a, about a few months ago, six or eight months ago, apparently I didn't know this, but you can rename those places to whatever you want them to. 
And so our 14-year-old thought it would be fun if he'd go in and just rename places that he thought fit him. And so he renamed our, our home, our home address, and he renamed it Danny's Dome. <laughs> and then he renamed work, this place, here at local, he re renamed this place Christopher's Cave. <laughs> and you go, why? I don't know. He's 14. He's got a weird sense of humor. And so it's always like, Dad showed up at Christopher's Cave. You know, Mom has been at Danny's Dome. He was like, oh, my goodness, all those type of things. And so about a month or a month and a half ago, uh, a buddy of mine gave me a tour of Trillis Studios down south of Atlanta, the movie studios down there. Dan Cathy is doing fascinating tour down there and all the things that are happening. It was a wonderful day. I come home that evening, and at dinner time, we're kind of hanging out eating dinner. And Daniel asked me, he goes, hey, how was work today? I was like, it's fine. He never really asked about my work. And I go, it's fine. Why? He goes, well, I noticed you were an hour and a half away from us today. And I was like, you're checking up on your old man. Like, I was like, that's so sweet. I was like, I was down at Trilla Studios and that kind of stuff. He's like, oh, okay, I just, I just saw you down there and then watched you come back. And I was like, weren't you supposed to be in school type of deal? Like, anyway, I, I share that with you because on the app, no matter where you go, you can find anybody, no how, matter how far they run or drive away. And I share that with you because Jonah, in his mind, thought in chapter 1 that he could run away from God. If I just run the opposite direction, I could get away from God, I could run, I could hide from the thing that God was telling him to do. But ultimately, and you're going to see, God is sovereign, God is in control, and he knew exactly where Jonah was at. Jonah chapter 1, we're going to pick it up in verse 1. Here's how the story unfolds. It says, The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against him because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. And he bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, don't miss this, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted, get up, pray to your God, Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. So God tells Jonah, the prophet Jonah, hey, I need you to go to the city of Nineveh to preach a message of repentance to him. Jonah knows the, the rep, uh, reputation of Nineveh. He knows they're brutal. He knows they hate their enemies. He goes, ain't no way. I'm going in the opposite direction. And so he boards a ship and he's heading the exact opposite direction from Nineveh. God sends a storm, and he's sound asleep in the middle of it. A guy wakes him up, goes, hey, what's going on? Pick it up in verse 7. It says, then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused this terrible storm. And when they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come down on us? They demanded, who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I'm a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know this terrible storm is all my fault. And so they wake him up, and what's interesting, they wake him up, he realizes he's in the middle of a storm, and what's interesting to me is that Jonah does not come clean and say it's his fault until they cast the lots. And so they wake the storm up, the, the captain wakes him up, he's like, hey, this is a bad storm. If you're Jonah, and you're a prophet of the Lord, and you know the Lord created the wind and the sea and the storm... You know you're running away from the Lord. It just seems to me that logic would go, hey, this could be on me. This could be my fault. This could be, this could be my bad. But he doesn't say anything until they cast lots, which you like draw straws or throw dice. And it pointed out that, that Jonah was the culprit. And he finally comes clean and says, yep, it's all my fault. And here's how the story finishes up. 
verse 13, it says, Instead, the sailors rode even harder to get the ship to land, but the stormy sea was too violent for them and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God, O Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin. And don't hold us responsible for his death, O Lord. You have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up, threw him into the raging sea, and the storm was stopped at once. The sailors were all struck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now, the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. And here is the idea, the main principle I want you to grasp from chapter 1, and it's simply this, is that when God says go, don't say no. When God says go, don't say no. He told told Jonah, go to Nineveh. He might be telling you, you need to go to rehab. You need to go to a marriage counselor. You need to go toward forgiveness. You need to go toward self-control. You need to go toward purity. You need to go toward someone or something. You need to go toward that conversation that you have been avoiding. And for whatever reason, in our own mind, I think many of us are like Jonah. We know how painful that's going to be. We know how difficult that's going to be, how scary that's going to be. And so we just cross our arms and say, no. And we might even go the opposite direction of where God is calling us to go. And I just want to point out a couple of things about Jonah and ask a couple of questions and overlay them onto your life and on, onto mine. I want you to go back and I want you to look at verse 3. Verse 3. It says, after, after God told him, it says, But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. And he bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. First question, first idea is simply this. Are you running to or from God? Are you running to or from God? When God tells you to go, to go to the counselor, to go to rehab, to go to 12-step, to go toward forgiveness, to go toward reconciliation, to go toward purity. When God's telling you go toward something, the question is, do you run to God, the thing that he's telling you, or do you run away from God? And it's really either or, because it's not both and. And if you're not running to God, then the reality is you're running away from God. You go, well, I'm just standing still. If you're standing still, you're moving away from God. Because sin will always, our sin will always pull us away from God. So unless you're making a conscious effort to run to God, sinful nature means you're running away from God. And it's really a simple question you've got to ask. When God tells you to go, do you run toward the thing that God is telling you to go to, or do you stand still and backtrack? And you see Jonah. He wasn't just th- there kind of trying to figure it out. It says he runs in the opposite direction. He doesn't sort of kind of meander toward Nineveh or take a long route. He, Nineveh's this way. He points the boat in this direction and heads this way. The exact opposite direction. And so when it comes to your life, when God is telling you to go toward something, do you run to God or do you run away from God? And I fully understand that God telling Jonah to go to Nineveh is a scary deal. Nineveh was brutal to their enemies. They had a reputation amongst them. And so for Jonah to go there would be scary, would be unnerving, would be one of those things going, I'm not sure I want to do that. And I think for many of us, God is telling us to go toward a certain direction. We go, yeah, I'm not sure I want to do that. That's scary. That's the unknown. I'm not sure this is what I really want to do. I know God's telling me to, but instead, I'm going to do an about face and head in the opposite direction. You know the things that you're supposed to do. You know the place that you're supposed to go. But for whatever reason, fear sets in and you run the opposite direction. Now, This October, I'll have been your pastor for uh, seven years. And in those seven years, I have preached a lot of messages um, to you. Um, Some good, some not so good. We don't need to get into that at this moment. But over those years, I've preached a lot of messages. And there's one follow-up question that I get, really probably the top two or three follow-up questions. Out of all the messages that I've preached, one of the top follow-up questions that I get. Now, mind you, I spend hours and hours trying to prepare these messages for you. 
I'm on my knees before the Lord going, Lord, what do you want me to say? And one of the top questions that I get asked, follow up about my message, about my sermon is this. So how is your goose doing? <laughs> That's it. Not, hey, do you think you can expound this? How is the goose doing? And if you weren't here earlier this spring, my wife bought a goose. All right? It's a long story, but she bought a goose. And so here's the update. The goose is fully grown and really mean. <laughs> and I don't get along with her, and she doesn't get along with me, and it's just one of those deals. Her name is Lucy the Goose, and uh, she's just full grown and mean as can be, and she kind of acts as a protector for the ducks or whatever. I don't really like her. She doesn't like me. We just kind of live with that in our house. Now, earlier this week, Brianna, she asked me, she goes, hey, can you put away the ducks and everything in the little, the little house that they have? I was like... I guess. I was like, how do I do that? She goes, well, you just kind of take your arms and do this, and you kind of get them into the house. I was like, that's fine. So I go out there one evening, and I start getting doing like this. And, and the ducks, no problem. They run right into the house. And then all of a sudden, the goose bows up to me. <laughs> and I'm like trying to do this, and Brandon goes, walk toward the goose, and she'll go in the house. I'm like, I am. And I start walking toward the goose. This goose starts hissing at me. And, and I don't know, we're friends, right? And so I can, I can, I would prefer to stay in this room if you don't mind. Here's what I did, and I don't know why I did this. My natural action, this goose started hissing at me. All I did was I lifted up my leg like this. <laughs> Just held it like that. And I don't know if like my inner karate kid came out. Like I grew up in that movie and I was kind of like one of these deals. And you know what the goose did? She swept the leg. If you're a fan of that movie, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, she had no mercy. Like, I did this, and she hisses louder, and she comes after me, and I turn, and I run away. <laughs> Judge all you want to. You don't have a goose in your backyard fighting you. And I run away, and Brian goes, no, run toward the goose. I was like, it's mean. She goes, just, just go toward the goose, and she'll go in. I go, I've tried, and it won't. And so it's one of those deals where this goose was scary as all get out, and I'm just in my shorts, T-shirt, and Crocs, which are not like real good fighting gear for geese. I just want to like, let you know. And she goes, well, you just have to get big, and you'll move the goose in there. And I was like, I know that's true for bears. I didn't know that's true to be like for geese. And she goes, just get big. And so... I get a, a barbecue tool, one of my barbecue brushes things, and I just start doing this. And I guess I got big enough to where she backed away, put her in her house, and I was like, I'll show you who's boss. <laughs> now, I tell you this because I was told, and I know, go toward the goose. That's the way you get her in there. But, man, it was scary, and all of a sudden, my natural inclination was to run away. It was the unknown. It was the uncertain. Like, this is, this is a really tough situation. And Jonah is experiencing the same thing. It wasn't like God told him to go start a church in Hawaii. Like, hey, Oceanfront Community Church, why don't you go start that thing? And it, he's going, go to Nineveh. It's difficult. They're mean. They're ruthless. And he goes, no way. I'm going in the opposite direction. And God may be asking you to go someplace or to do something that's difficult. Like forgiveness is a difficult, difficult thing. Reconciliation is a difficult thing. Self-control is a difficult thing. Purity in your relationships is a difficult thing. But if God is saying go in that direction, my friendly advice to you is to don't tell the God of the universe no. Do not run in the opposite direction to run toward what God is telling you to do. So when God says go, go, don't say no. And so the question is, is are you running to or from God? I want you to go down. I want you to look at verse 12. And this is what's interesting. Verse 12, it says, throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know this terrible storm is all my fault. Now, here's what's interesting is he's running away from God in the exact opposite direction. God sends a storm. He's sound asleep. The captain wakes him up. And when he wakes him up, Jonah doesn't confess then. Jonah only comes clean after the lots were cast. They pointed at he was the culprit. And he goes, oh, yeah, this is on me. This is all my fault. And so here's the question I'd love to overlay on your life is simply this, is are you concealing or confessing your sin? Are you concealing or are you confessing your sin? 
I've preached this point for years, but the idea is to correct your private sins before they become public disasters. It's those things in your life where God's saying go, you've said no, there is a sin in your life. There's something that you're doing in the exact opposite of what God wants to go, where he wants you to go in your life, and it's been revealed to you or it's been brought to your attention, and it is very easy just to conceal it. There's nothing to see here. There's nothing to just kind of go on about your business. It's not that big a deal. And we minimize it. We push it aside. Or do we confess our sin? 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it begins with a confession of what's going on in the sin in your heart. And you see Jonah there. He's brought back in, in front of everybody going, who are you? And he goes, this is all my fault. When it comes to your life, those private things in your life, those things that probably the person next to you don't, doesn't even know about, I certainly don't know about, but it's when you and God, you know he's told you to do that. You know you, he's told you to go in that certain direction. And you sit there with a happy church face on and going, it's not that big a deal. It's all fine, it's all going to be good, but there is a sin inside your heart that you have yet to confess before God. Are you concealing or are you confessing your sin? You can conceal it, you can, can, you can hide it for so long, but eventually that sin will come to the surface. Eventually when it comes, all of a sudden there's way more collateral damage, way more pain, way more hurt than if you'd come clean and confess to a holy God of your sin going, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me and walk back toward God. Are you confessing or are you concealing your sin? In our house, our kids sometimes confuse the word cleaning with the word hiding. And so when they're told to clean their room, I think they hear, I don't know whatever happens in an elementary kid, they hear the word hide everything in your room from mom and dad. It's the exact same thing. Nobody will notice. And so we'll tell them to clean their room, and to us, it looks clean. Until all of a sudden, that bowl of cereal that was put underneath their sink turned into a bowl of cheese. And now all of a sudden, a certain smell begins to come from my daughter's room. And all of a sudden, we're go, I go, hey, did you hide a bowl of cereal underneath your sink last week? She looks at you and goes, yeah, I did. <laughs> I was like, why? She goes, I didn't want to bring it downstairs. I just thought I'd put it there. And, and if you, there, so it's, it's cereal, it's snacks, it's food, it's all the things where they'll hide it. They won't clean it. They won't take it downstairs. They won't throw it in the trash. They'll open up their closet door. They'll open up a drawer. They'll put it underneath their bed, underneath their sink. As long as it's hidden, nobody knows until everybody knows. As long as the food's put away and mom and dad don't know, it's fine until about a week goes by and the milk turns to cheese and it's nasty and all of a sudden it is gross and worse than if they had just cleaned it the week before. It's the same with your sin. A guy like me gets up on a stage like this and preaches about sin and Jesus just go, I'm good. I mean, I, I, mean I, I tell him maybe there's a little white lies here and there, or not that big a deal. But there's that thing that Gosh, you have stuffed it so far down in your life, and all of a sudden it begins to bubble. I'm just here to tell you, confess your sin sooner rather than later. To come clean before a holy God of the universe. God is telling you to go towards something. He's telling you to go in a certain direction. And out of pride, out of ego, out of fear, whatever it is, you have turned, you've walked in the opposite direction. Stop and confess your sin before the Lord. Do not conceal it any longer. And you see Jonah. Finally, after all this time of hearing God go this direction, he heads this direction, buys the ticket, gets on the boat, goes down the bottom of the boat. The storm is there. He's woken up. Doesn't really come clean until they cast the lots. He goes, oh, this is my fault. He finally does the right thing at the end, but not until a whole lot of damage was done. Not until all the cargo was thrown over the ship. Not until all the sailors were scared for their lives. But in the end, he finally does come clean and says, this is all my fault. When God says go, don't say no. So what do you do with all of this? My prayer and hope is that you hear four very, very simple words. And I don't know who I'm talking to. My guess is I'm probably talking to everybody in this room at some level. But the four words I would love for you to hear and think about if you hear nothing else is simply this. Turn back 
to God. Turn back to the God who loves you, who cares for you, who's sovereign, who's in control, who holds everything together. Turn back to him before it is too late. In my line of work, I've just had a front row seat to watching so many people destroy their lives because of their sin and their pride of not wanting to confess it or come clean. Push it away. It's not that big a deal. Life is good. Look at all the other things going on over here. Pay no attention to this in in the background. And this in the background is festering and bubbling over. And at some point, it explodes and causes all sorts of collateral damage for everything else over here. And goes, what happened? What happened is you concealed it. You hit it. It wasn't that big a deal. Rather than coming clean, turning back to God, confessing before him. And saying, God, I have for far too long walked in this direction. I'm stopping and I'm turning this way and I'm turning back to God. And my guess is I'm hitting every person in this room at some level. There's something in your life that God is telling you to go to. There's some sin that you and I need to confess before a holy God. And if you're sitting here with your arms crossed and going, this doesn't apply to me, Chris, I would just simply throw out the sin pride. Arrogance, self-righteousness, you choose, right? There's something that all of us should go, yeah. Yep, I've gone this direction for far too long. I know God wants me to go in this direction, but this direction is a lot easier. This direction is candidly a lot more fun, a lot more popular, makes me a lot more money. And God said, no, 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 I need you to go to Nineveh. I need you to head this direction. And so if you're walking this direction, today I would stop and I would do an about face and I would turn back to God who loves you, who cares for you, who offers mercy and grace through his son Jesus. I'm going to finish with some verses out of Hebrews and then a a hymn. And so I just want to read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, and then finish with a hymn. Hebrews 4, the writer says this, it says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weakness, for he faced all the same testings we did, yet he did not sin. So, let us, and that those of us who call Jesus a Savior, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I share that with you, because fast forward to today, you and I get to experience mercy and grace and forgiveness of our sins because of what Jesus did. That is the good news of Jesus. That is the hope of salvation. To serve a holy, righteous God as sinful human beings, but because of Jesus, you and I are viewed as God, from God as holy and as righteous when we place our faith in His Son, Jesus. And so if you're headed in this direction and God wants you to go there, I would stop today, turn around, and head toward the thing God wants you to do. There's a famous preacher in the 1700s, his name is John Wesley. He had a lesser-known brother, famous brother named Charles Wesley. Charles was a prolific hymn writer, wrote like 6,500-plus hymns, crazy amount of hymns. Probably one of the most famous hymns that he's written that you and I sing today is the Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. But there's this hymn that he wrote called Depth of Mercy, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, just a few of the verses. But I just love the words that he puts pen to paper And what it means in light of where we're headed, where God's going, and what it means to receive the mercy of God. He writes this. Depth of mercy, can there be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear me, the chief of sinners spare? There for me the Savior stands, holding forth his wounded hands. God is love, I know, I feel. Jesus weeps and loves me still. Now incline me to repent. 
Let me now my sins lament. Now my foul revolt deplore. Weep, believe, and sin no more. Let me pray for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, for those of you in this room that you've placed your faith in Jesus, but you've been walking in the opposite direction, there's some sin going on in your heart, in your soul, in your mind, I would just in this moment repent of it and turn back to God before it is too late to confess your sins before a holy God, to stop hiding them, to stop concealing them, but to turn back to a holy, righteous God. And if you're here and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, maybe today is the day you turn to him for the very first time. God loves you, God who cares for you, God who sent his son Jesus to the cross for you. And all you have to do is place your faith in him. And maybe right there where you're sitting, you just place your faith in Jesus, confess your heart and your soul and what's going on to say, today, Jesus, I place my faith in you for the salvation of my soul and forgiveness of my sins. And you just begin to work through that in your own heart, in your own soul, in your own mind. Father, I pray for all of us here in this room. Lord, sometimes it can be scary, it can be unnerving when you tell us to go into a certain direction. But Lord, my prayer is that by faith and through obedience, we would walk in the ways that you tell us to go. We would run to you, not away from you. We would confess our sins to you, knowing and trusting that you will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Jesus, we love you. We ask all these things in your precious and holy name.